if we're going to look at the Rockefeller drug laws, if we're going to look at the victims of the Rockefeller drug laws, not only those victims who are incarcerated, but those victims who love those who, incar who are incarcerated, that is the family. Because I would contend that when one person gets locked up, the whole family actually is getting locked up. Because they now uh, are, uh, are tied to the destiny of whatever happens to their loved one there. And any human rights issue that affects an individual who's locked up affects the family of that individual that is locked up. So then we must begin to think outside of the box of, um, of all of that in terms of not just what happens to that individual, but what happens to the family of that individual. Not only what happens to that individual with respect to their civil rights, but what happens to that individual with respect to their human rights. Uh, we know that, uh, that throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, that there was a mighty struggle, some would say a 85% successful struggle for civil rights. And that was the ground uh, that we battled on, and that was the, the right that we battled for. And, uh, and that was something that was worthy of being battled for and should uh, be protected. As we know, those things that we call civil rights are those rights that we derive uh, as a result of being citizens from the United, of the United States, and they're derived from the various uh, amendments and provisions in the U.S. Constitution. So whatever civil rights we have are those civil rights that derive from the Constitution and the amendments to the Constitution. Obviously, the Constitution wasn't sufficient when they, uh, when they wrote it, and that's why they had to keep on amending it over and over until they got it right. And it might be right now, but they're not applying it right. So here we have a situation where we're looking at how do we begin to think outside of the box, even in terms of how we fight for civil rights. Because since the Reagan years, the ground has shifted in terms of how we fight for civil rights. Prior to uh, the Reagan years, you remember that uh, there were a lot of uh, class action suits, through, particularly in the 1970s, that were successfully won. But when uh, Reagan got into office, they shifted the ground. They changed the rules so that when Reagan got into office, they changed it so that no longer uh, could you look at a class action suit, a charge of institutional racism, systemic racism, or structural racism uh, as a way of saying, well, be based on this effect, this discriminatory effect, this class has been aggrieved. They uh, deserve remedy as a result of these uh, discriminatory practices. They changed it so that now it's no longer dealing with proving effect. It, you have to prove intent. So then they took down the sign that said white only and black only, col colored only and white only. Uh, but, the, uh, but now the, the, that, that intent remains not just in the, uh, in the policies, but in the practices. So even though the things that were written into the law might have been changed in terms of, of, of the, uh, the demise of Jim Crow and segregation, the practices have continued on. As I was talking to Reverend Billings uh, earlier, um, my point as we talk about the Constitution, I move on a little bit from that, uh, you'll remember that people of African descent in the U.S. Constitution were designated as how much of a human being? Three-fifths Three of a human being. And this did not change until the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which provided equal protection of the laws. Three-fifths of a human being, that's by the law. We were treated as three-fifths of a human being. We weren't even people. We were chattel property. The Civil War comes and goes. We have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, and here we have the 14th Amendment wherein we get the Equal Protection uh, Clause. But my opinion, and this is just my opinion, is that even though the law changed, and they say that uh, in the law, uh, three-fifths uh, is no longer applicable in terms of de jure what is in the law, I would say that, that uh, through the entirety of the United States history, 
from the signing of the Constitution to this very moment, even though they changed the law, the practices have remained constant throughout. Indeed, black people only have three-fifths of a right to anything that white people have in the United States. So I would say that as we look at the racist effect of the Rockefeller drug laws, we can see the legacy of being treated and being designated as three-fifths of a human being. We're, 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 we deserve three-fifths of the judgment of the justice that other people uh, get. We des deserve three-fifths of the fairness that other people get. We deserve three-fifths of, um, of the equity and equality that other people are, are deserving. So then, as we begin to think about how do we fight for the civil rights of people that are obviously being violated under the Rockefeller drug laws, it becomes increasingly difficult to say that as a class of people, we can say that now we, all these people are being messed over, their rights are being violated, but we can't get a class actions, we can't get any fire going, you know, under a class action suit. What are we to do? We need to think outside the box. This is what my point is. We need to begin to think of a point outside of the periphery of the imaginary box wherein we find our constitutional rights uh, confining us now. We know that we are right now uh, in a regime uh, in the United States where the president does not, it not, does not respect the Geneva Convention, does not respect the Constitution of the United States, and does not respect any treaties that the United States has signed on to. We got trouble, my friends, right here in River City with that kind of regime uh, operating and denying us our civil and human rights. And when we think about the human rights regime, they have within the UN, at the international level, they have a different standard for, for proving. They have a different standard for analyzing they have a different standard for adjudicating what might be a violation of one's rights. And they're not concerned as much with intent as results and effect. What are the effects of this law? What are the effects of, um, of these practices? What are the effects of these policies? This is the main thing that we're looking at here at the human rights level. And we've got a little uh, competition from outside and that's all right, too. But uh, we're saying, then, that we need to be aware not only of the civil rights of the people who are locked up in the Rock Rock Rockefeller drug laws, but we need to be concerned about the human rights of the Rockefeller drug laws uh, in terms of uh, those violations that uh, are, are proceeding from them. Uh, I'll share with you a few more comments because we have uh, actually a, an expert and experts on the Rockefeller drug laws, uh, more expert than I here, who are waiting for me to uh, shut up and sit down. And I want to hear what they want to say too, So, uh, but I'm not sitting down yet, so, uh, so we just, uh, just hang on. Okay, so, so I said that the United States has